Good evening. It's time for us to begin our evening worship. So glad that everyone here to make it here today, especially to our visitors. We're especially glad that you're here and also to the members as well. We would ask that at this time, if you would, silence any noise makers that may disturb worship at this time. Our opening song of this evening will be B44 in your, in your black folders, B44. Let's continue to remember Andy, uh, Andy Delaney and uh, Dana Delaney and also Derek Broom as they're away from us right now in Fiji on a mission trip. So they'll be there two weeks. So let's con continue to remember them and their, their efforts there, there as they're there, their safety uh, and the works that they are doing there as well. Let's continue to remember John Allman. Uh, he had surgery on Friday. I believe uh, I was told he was here this morning. So he must be doing something better. So let's continue to remember him as he continues to recover. Deacons, remember uh, this evening, uh, you need to turn in your budget sheets uh, to William Case. If you have them already, turn your budget sheets into William Case. Early risers will be meeting October the 25th at 7 a.m. at Chick-fil-A. Early risers, 7 a.m. on the 25th at Chick-fil-A. Uh, work project, October the 29th from 7.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. See Hiram um, Sturgis for details, if you are able to uh, assist with that. Uh, last, the later sixth grade and under Bible Bowl practice Thursday night at 6, I assume 6 p.m. at the home of Drew and Morgan Delaney. Car care group number four, uh, Dustin Jeffers and Michael Griffith uh, will be meeting tonight as well. But before we begin, let's begin with a word of prayer. Oh, Lord, our God, we are so thankful, Father, that you have allowed us to be here once again this, this day, Father. We thank you for the opportunity that you gave us this morning, that we was able to hear a part of your word, Father, spoken this morning. And Father, we pray uh, the, as we listen tonight, Father, we listen to tentative, Father, in the view of eternity, Father, that we know, Father, the things that Gary will speak tonight will be uplifting and, and applies to our lives, Father, and will be beneficial to all of us, Father. Father, we pray that the things that he say tonight, Father, will be according to your word and, and giving a clear recollection of things, Father, that he has studied, Father. Father, we continue to pray for the ones who are sick among us, Father. Be with each and every one of them, Father. Bless them in the things that they stand in need of, Father. Father, we pray that you look to the doctors and nurses that are, attend to their needs, Father. We pray that the, you guide their thoughts and, Father, the things that needed to, to, to heal their bodies, Father. Father, we pray for this church, Father, family here, Father. We pray for each and every member, Father. May we, may we continue, to, Father, to look towards you, Father, for guidance. Father, we pray that you would give each one of us strength, uh, as we, if we live our lives, Father, that we be that shining light up on that hill, Father. Father, we thank you so much for this country that we live in, that you blessed us to live in, Father, that we are uh, so blessed, Father, beyond measure to, to have so much in this country, Father. But, Father, we're so thankful, Father, that we have the, the ability to, Father, to worship you, Father, without fear or outside intervention, Father. Father, once again, we pray for the leadership of this congregation, Father. We pray, Father, that you would strengthen it, Father, always, Father. Father, that we will look towards you, Father, for guidance and the things that you have us to do, Father. Father, we pray for each, our deacons, Father, each and every one of them, Father, that the ministries that they have and the works that they do, Father, that you give them strength, Father, and understanding the things that they do as well, Father. Father, we pray for this leadership of this country, Father. Guide their thoughts and direction, Father. We pray, Father, that they will look towards you, Father, for that guidance, Father. Be with us, Father, in the entirety of this service, Father. As we lift up your, our voices as a hymns to you, Father, and in prayers, Father, we pray that everything will be done accepted and pleasing in your sight. Forgive us when we fall short of your will as we return and repent of those things. It's your name we do humbly pray. Amen. I have him ever say. On bending knee I come with a humble heart I come bowing down before your holy throne lifting holy hands to Yeah. 
Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this time once again we've had to come here on this first day of the week to hear another portion of your word. We're thankful for uh, this country that we live in, that we are able to do this with, without the fear of harassment. Um, we pray now for those that were mentioned this morning and just a minute ago, those that uh, need our prayers, those that are sick, um, those that are dealing, uh, they're having surgeries, uh, be with the doctors and nurses that will see after them. Um, be with us and help us to be uh, the, uh, the examples that they need and help that they need. Be with us now as we enter this hour of worship. Help us to set aside our worldly thoughts and uh, listen to the message that uh, Brother Gary will bring to us from your word. All these things we ask in your son's name. Amen. My final selection before the message will be him... <clears throat> 480, 480. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 5. If you're able and willing, stand at this time. <clears throat> Yes, I know that's the same picture I used last week. It's just got different words on it. I'm fully aware of that. Okay. The song leader wanted all you folk to know that don't look at the up here, but you have your old books open. Turn to number 10. Number 10 is, will be the song of invitation. Last week, we started to look at the church, and we're trying to understand the church a little bit better. I noted then, and I'll note it again, that there are a number of different expressions or descriptions that are used for the church in Scripture. All of them are intended to help us better understand what the church is all about. One of those, interesting enough, is the tabernacle of the Old Testament. We began to look at that last week, particularly we zeroed in on Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5. There are three very important words that are found in that verse that we do not want to forget. The first of those is copy, the second is shadow, and the third is pattern. As we look at each one of those words, 
What we need to come to realize is that every one of those words points out the fact that this thing, whatever it was, already existed in the mind of God. And that the tabernacle is merely like a shadow. It's not the substance. The substance is something else. And so tonight, as we continue this study, what we want to come to realize is the church is God's original holy place. That it existed before the tabernacle was built. Now, someone might say, no, wait, wait a minute. The doors of the church house, so to speak, did not open until Acts chapter 2. And that would be true. But in the mind of God, the church was established in the long ago. In fact, in the book of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul talks about uh, before the foundation of the world, that God made this plan, that he knew all along what he was going to do, and that the, the tabernacle then had to be made just so, so that it reflected the true tabernacle of God, the true, in this case, holy place, as we look at the church. So turn with me, if you will, and let's begin to think about this. First of all, noting that in order to enter the tabernacle or the true holy place, you've got to wash to enter. Look, if you would, to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 30. We're going to pick up at verse 18. Here Moses is giving instructions in regard to the tabernacle, and particularly in reference to Aaron and his sons as they serve as priests in the holy place. Listen to what he says. You shall make a laver of bronze with its base, also of bronze, for washing. You shall put it between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar, and you shall put water in it. For Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet in water from it. When they go into the tabernacle of meeting, or when they come near the altar to minister, to burn an offering made by fire to the Lord, they shall wash with water, lest they die. So they shall wash their hands and their feet, lest they die. And it shall be a statute forever to them, to him and to his descendants throughout their generations." How important was it to wash, for a priest to wash before he entered into the holy place? How important? Well, it depends on whether you want to live or die. It's vitally important if you want to stay alive, because you've got to wash before entering. That is a hard and fast rule. It never changes. It's a little bit concerning to me that right now we have people within our own brotherhood who are suggesting that God is flexible in his thinking. That's not consistent with anything found in Scripture. God is not flexible. God's laid down the pattern, the, the means that he wants, and he expects us to follow it. So, to enter the holy place, you've got to wash. Now, that being the case, since the church is the original holy place, would it surprise you to know that you got to wash in order to enter the church. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2. You remember that the apostle Peter has stood up with the eleven, and they've begun to declare the gospel unto that assembled multitude. The people within this multitude were the very ones who just a, some days previous had actually called for the death of Jesus Christ. And when Pilate said, I'm washing my hands of him, I'm not going to be responsible for his blood, their response was to say, his blood be on us and on our children. And so they readily accepted the fact that this man was being put to death because of them. Now, Peter comes along and he says, the very one that you crucified, the very one whose blood you said, let it be on our hands, and on the hands of our children, that very one God has raised from the dead. And then he says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Where is he? Sitting on the throne. That's what Peter said. 
And so you can imagine maybe just a little bit what those folks in that audience felt like. Luke reports they were cut to the heart. Can you not feel, almost feel the pain with the realization of what you have done and how bad it really was? that you put to death the Son of God? And so they cried out and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Now listen to the answer as it comes back from Peter, beginning in verse 38. Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and your children and all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. And those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Do you have to wash in order to enter into God's original, the holy place? into the church? And the answer clearly is yes. The Apostle Paul telling his own story in Acts chapter 22, verse 16. You remember what has happened, right? On the road to Damascus, he's realized that he's been, he's been persecuting the very Son of God and his church. And so he cries out to Jesus and he says, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And what did the Lord say? Go into the city. And there will be told thee what thou must do. All right, he went into the city. And on the third day, after three days of fasting and praying, a man by the name of Ananias came to him. And what did Ananias say? Paul relates it himself, Acts 22, verse 16. And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now, I have a question for you, and it's one as, not as much for you as it is for the people that you may talk with day to day. If you are saved before you're baptized, what are these sins that have to be washed away? If you're already clean, why do you need to be washed? Jesus made that very point. Don't you remember on the night in which he was to be betrayed? He washed their feet, and Peter, you know how he is, he wasn't going to let him do it. And the Lord responded and said, if I I don't wash your feet, you don't have any part of me. And then Peter, again, his normal impetuous response says, well, don't just wash my feet, wash my head and my hands too. And the Lord says, it suffices to wash the feet. Why? Because that's what was dirty. That's what needed to be clean. They had walked on dusty roads all that day, and what needed to be clean was their feet. So here we come in a parallel type of example, and we ask a very important question of our religious neighbors. And that is, if you're saved before you're baptized, why do you need to wash away sins? You don't have any. At least by the way you're arguing. But that's not what Ananias told Paul. Instead, he tells Paul, arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now watch. Peter agrees with that. He already did in Acts 2. But he agrees with it in his letter, his first epistle, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, when he says, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. How do you put away the filth of the flesh? What I'm saying is, if you're dirty at the end of a hard day of work, how do you get rid of the dirt? You take a bath, right? Now, somebody out there, some wiseacre is going to say, no, I take a shower. Okay, well, whatever you want to say, it's fine. The point is you wash, right, in order to be cleansed of the filth of flesh. Peter obviously sees baptism as a cleansing, but it's not a cleansing from dirt on the skin. It is a cleansing instead of sins. And it takes place in the water of baptism when we call out to God for a clean conscience. Our baptism 
is calling for God to cleanse our conscience on the basis of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So how do we enter God's original holy place? Same way they entered. You've got to wash to enter. Now, what else do we know about the holy place? We notice it's lighted to serve. You ever try to, uh, to do anything when the power goes out? Uh, I, I tell you what, I'm not going to cut an apple when the power goes out. Because I might not cut the apple. I might cut something else. You know, I need, you need light to be able to serve, to be able to work. Well, no surprise, this tent now didn't have any light. No light yeah, that comes from the outside. It didn't have a, a great big bay window or anything like that. It didn't have a skylight, none of that going on. No, it is a tent completely enclosed. It's got to have light so they can serve. So look, if you would, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 and the first part of verse 2. Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lampstand. Now, I've given you the reference there, Exodus chapter 25, verses 31 to 40. That reference is going to show you the the explanation of how the lampstand was to be made. You got to have light. You got to have light to be able to work inside this tent that no has no external, no sunlight within it. So what about the church? Well, the church also needs to be lighted. And the first thing we need to realize is that Jesus is the light of the church. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of John. John chapter 1. John opens up introducing Jesus uh, in the opening verses, 1 through 3. And then in verse 4, he talks about him this way. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all through him I believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. Who did John give witness to? John the Baptist. He gave witness to Jesus, didn't he? Two times in this very same chapter, John chapter 1, two times on two separate occasions, you find John saying, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Who did he bear witness to? He bore witness to Jesus. Jesus is the light of the church. But then we can also say that God's Word is the light of the church. In the book of Psalms, Psalm chapter 119, verse 105, he says, Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. How are we going to see the path on which we ought to walk? Now, where we're going to serve God? And the answer is we're going to use the Word of God. The Word of God, which, by the way, uh, where did that Word come from? Well, you might say, well, the Holy Spirit inspired uh, men to write it down, and that would be correct. I'm not going to argue with that. That's exactly what Jesus said would happen. In John chapter 14, John chapter 15, and John chapter 16. So I know it's true. If Jesus said it, it's right. So now we know how, where the Word came from. It came from the Holy Spirit inspiring men to write. But wait a minute. Where did the Holy Spirit get the Word from? Well, He got it from Jesus. If you look more closely, you will observe that Jesus said that the Spirit is not going to testify concerning himself, but instead he's going to bring to their remembrance all things that he said to them and the few things that he could not deliver to them because they were not ready when he walked on the earth. The Spirit would deliver the words that Jesus would have also said, extending on to that. So where did the Spirit get the word? Got it from Jesus. Now, if you want to go all the way back, 
look at the rest of the book of John and discover that Jesus got his words from the Father. So, so all that goes together very neatly, doesn't it? So where's the light that is in the church? Well, it comes from Jesus, and it comes from the word of Jesus, or if you would, the word of God, because they're one and the same thing. They're equal to one another. In the book of Psalms, again, Psalm chapter 19, verse 8, it's for that reason that the singer of Israel writes this. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, watch it, enlightening the eyes. What's going to open up our eyes so that we can see? You know, when it's pitch dark, you know what the first thing I do is? I go straight to where I keep my flashlight. And I know where that is. <clears throat> now, what you may not think about is I'm a preacher's kid. I've been walking through dark church buildings my whole life. I figure out where everything is, first few months that I'm in a place, and I walk through the building in the dark. Now, of course, you know, Mitzi's warned me, you know, occasionally, we have a snake get in here, and she said, you go down through the dark, do through here in the dark, you're not going to see the snake if it's in there. And she's right. I'm not going to see it. But as soon as I hear it, if, if you can hear it, I'm going to be gone. <laughs> the other direction, you'd be amazed how fast I can move. Because I don't like rattle-headed copper moccasins. <laughs> I'm opposed to them. But I can walk through in the dark. But if I'm going to do work, I've already told you. What am I going to do? I'm going to get a light on so I can see. I want my eyes enlightened. I want to know what's there so they know what I'm working with. Well, it works the same way in God's original holy place, the church. The Word of God is its light. But furthermore... Christians are to be light. Look at the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, begin at verse 14, where Jesus said, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, neither do men light a candle, put under a bushel, but on a candlestick. <clears throat> and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So how is the church lit up? Well, it's lit up by Jesus, of course. It's lit up by the Word of God, which ultimately is the Word of Christ. And it is lit up by Christians who ultimately are what? They're followers of Christ, reflecting His light. If you don't believe that, look at Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul, writing to that good church at Philippi, Beginning in verse 14 makes this statement. Do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I've not run in vain or labored in vain among whom you shine as lights in the world. And it's interesting, the word literally translated to be luminaries. And how, how does a luminary work? Well, a luminary does not have a light of its own. It reflects light. The old luminaries they used to use in New Mexico, <clears throat> you know, were, didn't have any light of their own, but there was a candle inside. That's where the light came from. Well, for us... I don't have any light of my own, but Christ is inside, and that's where my light comes from, if I'm a Christian. That's where your light comes from, if you're a Christian. And so the original holy place, the church, has light just like the copy had when Moses built it. Our light is Jesus, the Word of God, and Christians. That's what lights up, as it were, the church. But then, <clears throat> it's not just a light that is there. Next, we'll observe that there are priests and the table. <clears throat> Again, look at what the writer of Hebrews says. It's at the end of the second verse of Hebrews chapter 9, when he writes, The table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. Now, he's been talking about everything that's in the holy place. And that's why he talks about the sanctuary 
a place that is sanctified by what? By the very presence of God's servants, uh, ultimately, and by the fact that, that they are serving Almighty God, whose Shekinah, whose glory would come and dwell in the most holy place, which, by the way, we hope to talk about next week in more detail. But tonight we're looking at the church, the original holy place. We observe that it has what? It has a table, and it has priests that are working there. So let's go back, if you will, to the book of Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 24, we want to learn a little bit, if we can, about that table and what went on with it. Pick up at verse 5, Leviticus chapter 24. Everybody needs to notice this carefully. And you shall take fine flour and bake 12 cakes with it. Two tenths of an ephah shall be in each cake. You shall set them in two rows, six to a row, on the pure gold table before the Lord. And you shall put pure frankincense on each row, that it may be on the bread for a memorial, an offering made by fire to the Lord. Every Sabbath he shall set it in order before the Lord continually, being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. And it shall be for Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat it in a holy place, for it is most holy to him from the offerings of the Lord made by fire by a perpetual statute. Now, what did we just learn? Well, we got the table of showbread. We got that, don't we? What did they put on the table of showbread? Oh, they put 12 loaves. Those loaves represent the 12 tribes of Israel. God's people in the Old Testament. All right? How often do they put that bread on there? Why, it says every Saturday, every Sabbath, they put on 12 fresh loaves. What did they do with the old loaves? Did they just throw them away? No. No, it says the priests, Aaron and his sons, ate them in a holy place. So once every week, Aaron and his sons ate the bread from the table. Remember that. Now let's think about God's original holy place, the church. Go with me, if you will, to the book of 1 Corinthians. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to pick up and talk about the table around which we assemble in the church. Look at verse 17. Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you. Since you come together, not for the better, but for the worse, please, if not in your Bible, in your mind, underline the words, come together. We come together. That's what we're going to talk about. I right, keep going. Verse 18. For first of all, when you, uh-oh, there it is again, come together as a church. I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part... I believe it. For there must also be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you, oh, there it is again. When you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> now, wait a minute. Somebody says, see there, we're not supposed to eat the Lord's Supper. No, that's not what it said. What it says, when you're coming together, you're not coming to eat the supper. Now, let me see if I can give you an example, an illustration that will explain what we're talking about. What if a teacher in, let's say, the fifth grade, Corey, you got a fifth grade teacher under you? No, you're in the upper, you're up higher than that, right? Well, in the fifth grade, don't they have the children mostly all day long? Most, okay, that's what I need, okay. Sorry, we won't use you to talk about this, but, but a principal who has a teacher in the fifth grade, Going to, have these, going to have these children all day long. All right, as the day goes on, there are three little boys, and they're back there cutting up and carrying on and paying no attention whatsoever to the teacher. And finally, in exasperation, the teacher says, you boys didn't come here to learn. Now, does that mean they shouldn't have come there to learn? Or does that mean they didn't come there to learn? You get the idea, don't you? All right, when the brethren at Corinth came together around the table, they did not come together to eat the memorial feast called the Lord's Supper. I love what Brother Ellis did this morning. 
He specifically went to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 26, and what did he show? He showed how Jesus laid that out. And when we come together, it's to eat a memorial feast. What do we remember in that memorial feast? We remember the body of Jesus. We remember the blood of Jesus. That's what we do in that memorial feast. What were these brethren coming together to do? They were coming together to have a potluck meal. And you know, we got some ladies in this congregation that can make, there's a special dish they can make. I'm not going to name all of them, and I'm sure not going to tell you which women do it. Okay, because I don't want any more folks in on this than, than needs to be. We got some folks that know flat how to make some good banana pudding. And I have made an observation. There are certain folks within he, us here, and you know who you are, that don't go through the food line first. You go through the dessert line. What are you looking for? A big bowl of banana pudding. Now, what does that mean? That means when folks like me, they wait till the end and let everybody get, get whatever they want. When I get there, the only thing I can do is stick my finger in, rake it around the bowl, and stick it in my mouth. That's my banana pudding for the day. Okay, right? Okay, what was going on in Corinth? The same thing. They were coming together to eat. Not to eat the Lord's Supper. They were coming together to eat, period. And if one fellow was thirsty and he saw the fruit of the vine sitting there that was supposed to be used for the supper, he picked it up and chug-a-lugged it. If another fellow came along, he was hungry and he saw the bread and he thought, you know, I like bread. Then he'd just pick up the bread and eat all the bread. And because of that, they had destroyed this memorial feast. Now, Paul goes ahead and explains the memorial feast, as you very well know, very similar words to what we saw in Matthew, so I'm not going to reread them tonight. But go on down now to the last two verses of this chapter, verses 33 and 34, and watch the words. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. Now this time Paul's not talking about eating a meal, is he? He's talking about eating a memorial feast. And so he says, when you, uh-oh, do you hear the words? Come together. That's number four in this little bit of Scripture, right? Come together, come together, come together, come together. But that's not the last time. Look at the next verse where he says, but if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest when you do what? Come together. What? What? You come together for judgment, and the rest I will set in order when I come. So, when we're talking about the Lord's Supper, it's a table around which we gather. It was foreshadowed, as it were, foreshadowed in the tabernacle when the priests ate of that table, you know, every, every time that they came together, uh, once every week, when they removed the old loaves, and set them down. And that's the way it was done. Now, how often do we do this? How often should it be done? I know there's another verse to look at. Just hang on. We'll go back to it. I know where it is. All right, now watch this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I've given order unto the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. The wording upon the first day of the week in the original language is kata on sabbatu. You don't have to remember that, but mom and dad paid for me to learn it, so I'm using it, okay? What does it mean? Well, kata on sabbatu is first day of the Sabbath cycle. What's the first day of the Sabbath cycle? Well, if Saturday is the seventh day, what's the first day? That'd be Sunday, right? First day of the week. So how many first days of the week did they give? Were they commanded to give? Well, the word kata is an emphasizer. And if you're going to emphasize first day of the week, how are you going to do it? Everyone now, let me tell you something about our religious neighbors. 
I don't know a preacher in any denomination that's going to fail to take up a collection every Sunday. Truth is, they take up a collection every time they come together. That's period. Sunday, Wednesday, if they meet all week long, they take a collection up every time. Well, that's not biblical, is it? No, what's biblical is you, prote- you take up a collection every first day of the Sabbath cycle. That'd be Sunday. So when did they come together? Well, it sounded to me like they came together on Sunday. What does it sound like to you? But just in case you're still not sure that I know what I'm talking about, look at Acts chapter 20, verse 7. And brethren, you don't bring up Acts 20, verse 7 first, you bring it up last. Because if you don't have a command, a background command, then you cannot use an example. Okay, very important to realize that. This is just an example. As Luke wrote it down, what does he say in the opening part of the seventh verse of chapter 20? Now, on the first day of the week, watch this, when the disciples, what? Came together. Does that sound familiar? Isn't that the past tense of come together? At least it was when I was in English. They probably changed it since I was in there. They changed all the commas. I can't figure out where to use a comma anymore. But, I, but have they changed it? No, I don't think so. They came together. Paul used the words come together five times. Luke, who ran with Paul all through the book of Acts. What words does he use? When they came together. What did they come together for? Paul's already told us. They came together to break bread, which is no surprise. How often did they renew the table of showbread in the Old Testament? Once a week. How often do we renew the table in the New Testament? Once a week. What day is it on? For them, it was the Sabbath. For us, it's the first day. Now, who eats it? In the Old Testament, it was the priest that ate it. Turn over, if you would, to the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. And let's see what Peter has to say about this. You also, he's writing to those early Christians scattered all over the world. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a what? Holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So it sounds to me like Christians are the priests. Skip on down to verse 9. Let's see if I'm right about that. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Who are the priests? We are. Christians are. Do I need a priest to go before the throne for me? Not unless you're talking about Jesus, the high priest. I don't need a man to go before the throne for me. I can do it myself. Because I'm a priest, and so are you, if you're a member of the church. So God's original holy place, the church, has priests and a table. We're the priests. The table's the Lord's table. It's renewed every week. And then, a sweet smell going up to God. Turn back to Exodus again. I want to go back to that same chapter, Exodus chapter 30. And here Moses is writing down what God was telling him about the tabernacle. And in particular now, what we want to observe is what he says in verse 1 of chapter 30 of Exodus. You shall make an altar to burn incense on. You shall make it of acacia wood. All right. We're not going to go into how they made the, that incense uh, altar. doesn't matter for us. It did for them. But what we are going to observe is, what was the incense? More especially, when was it offered? Watch this. Skip down to verses 7 and 8. And Aaron shall burn on it sweet incense every morning. When he tends the lamps, he shall burn incense on it. And when Aaron lights the lamps at twilight, he shall burn incense on it a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. Well, how often did he offer it? Morning and night. 
Isn't that what it says? Morning and night. Not too surprising when you read the book of Daniel and he found out that they made a law that you couldn't offer a prayer to any god. What did he do? He went before his, uh, his window that was opened up to Jerusalem three times a day he prayed. I suspect one was in the morning, the other in the evening, and I don't know when the third one was. I can't tell you that. But I can, t- I can tell you my suspicion is the other two I pretty much know. Now, how does that work in the church? Do we have incense in the church? I don't smell any. We don't have, do we have any incense here? Yes, we do. Our incense is the prayers of the saints. Look at Revelation, Revelation chapter 5, verse 8, where the writer John reports what he heard. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense. Watch this which are the prayers of the saints. How many times have we offered incense in this gathering tonight so far? Two? Am I counting right? Isn't that right? James, didn't you offer a prayer? That's what I remembered. And then we had another prayer. I think John Mark led that one, right? Is that right? Yeah. So that's incense going up twice, right? That's what this says. All right, go on down. Revelation chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, with the prayers of the saints, ascended before God from the angel's hands. Do we have incense in the church? Absolutely. The incense that we offer is our prayers. Our prayers going up as a sweet smell before God. Why? Well, I suspect it's because in part in our prayers we give thanks to God for all that He's done. We praise Him for sending His Son and for raising Him from the dead for the blood that he shed, which is able to make us whole and make us one body, the church. God's original holy place was the church. The tabernacle was designed to show the Jews and us what was coming. But God already had in his mind. He'd already built it. He already had the thing to be taken as a model. He already had the substance that would make the shadow. He already had that which could be copied. All that already existed in the mind of God. The church is God's original holy place. We must wash to enter it. If you've not been washed, you're not in the church. It's that simple. Can't be. Not going to happen. Not only that, but it's lighted to serve. Lighted with the light of Jesus, the Word of God, and Christians. We furthermore have observed that it has priests and a table. The table is the Lord's table. How often do we priests partake of it? Because all Christians are priests. We've seen that. How often do we partake? Once a week. Every Lord's Day, we partake. And then we have seen a sweet smell going up to God. Our prayers going up before God's throne as a means of thanksgiving. The church is a marvelous, marvelous place. If you're not a part of it, we want to urge you to recognize now how you become a part. You need to be washed. You need to be cleansed. If you're ready, the Lord's already made the preparation. Why don't you come while we sing? Oh, to Jesus,
For those who didn't have the opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper, you can exit at this time. To my right, to room B2, you will be administered to. Our final selection will be in our folders B49. B49. And Brother Gary, it's ironic. You mentioned banana pudding. We got a big bowl that was made today. <laughs> so you don't have to lick the bowl. You just come by the house and you can have as much as you want. <laughs> Thank you for your Bible class and your two lessons. They were wonderful today. We're blessed to have you. B49. Well, I haven't ever seen you. Oh God, you are my God. Thank you for this Lord's Day that we could come together and worship you. Lord, I pray that each of us here have, have been able to take uh, everything that's been taught today in, in Bible class and in these two lessons Brother Gary's brought us. Lord, I pray that we'll each be able to take something from those and, and put them and use them in our lives. Lord, please be with those that are unable to be here uh, today and and be with them and, and comfort them for whatever reason that is, whether, whether sick or just the choice that they've made to, uh, to not participate in worship. Lord, please be with us and keep us safe and bring us back to the next point in time. In Christ's name, amen.